Welcome to the Mental Advantage Podcast. Whether you're an athlete trying to perform at your best when it counts the most, a coach or business leader trying to get more out of your team, or someone looking for more personal growth, this is the place for you. This podcast is your map to guide you to the right mindset, systems, and strategies you need to become the best version of yourself. And now, here's John Cullen and Brandon Allen. All right, Brandon, we get to uh, add a, another name to the list tonight, the list of uh, guests that we've been wanting uh, to get on the show. And we kind of teased this last week on the show. I think we're really looking forward to this conversation. You, know, you talk about somebody who, from a cerebral standpoint, right, the mental performance side of things, uh, really into more of the practical part of it, the practice of you know visualization and breathing and meditation and those things. Um, Alan Jager is somebody who's been around doing this for a while, about 30 years that he's put into, um, you know, helping people find that right mix of, you know, being present and staying present. For sure. And, um, you know, a lot of folks know Alan from um, the Jager sports um, and, and his, his, uh, J bands and, and some of the, the stuff that he does, but, you know, he's, he's really passionate about the mental side of things. I mean, it was, it was, you know, one of the cornerstones of why he started Jager sports. Um, but he is, he, man, he goes into places that makes you really kind of surf a little bit. I know that you and I took a lot of notes. I would recommend that the, uh, that the listeners go ahead and, and get, you know, a couple of pencils ready and, uh, and some paper uh, because he's got some really, really good stuff that, that can impact you uh, immediately. And um, um, it, absolutely just an absolutely great, great guest. couple of notes um, I want to bring up before we bring Alan on. One is he is the author of a book, uh, Getting Focused, Staying Focused. Um, you can pick that book on up online um, on Amazon. Uh, really highly encourage you to do that. And also, um, one of his vice presidents, speaking of Jager Sports, vice president of Jager Sports is a gentleman by the name of China McCarney, who has a really cool foundation that you'll talk, you'll hear us talk about in the show. But I want to make sure everybody gets this website. The website, uh, the, the, the group is Athletes Against Anxiety and Depression Foundation. And the website is www.aaad is in dog f.org. Um, so get online and check that out and support that. All of the resources and stuff that you purchase on that website goes to support the foundation. Uh, and I think it's one of those things that's really, really cool um, that, you know, you get somebody like that that's giving back. But to Brandon's point, you know, Alan, you know, here's somebody, Brandon, that since 1991, I mean, this, he, Alan, you mentioned J bands, but it's funny because I think most people know him or first learned about Alan Jager from the mental performance coaching uh, that he does. I mean, he's been a consultant. He's worked with over 200 professional athletes, including 2002 Cy Young Award winner Barry Zito. And then, of course, all stars Dan Heron and Andrew Bailey, among other uh, you know, sports figures and many, many college athletes along the way. But, you know, really, uh, I think to Brandon's point, it's a very educational talk, taking lots of notes. But it's one of those things that Brandon and I both would agree on this, uh, that you're you leave this conversation just feeling like you've got some work to do right in a good way. Oh, like sure. he, 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 sure. it's a, it's a conversation that challenges you to go out and take action and do something more. For sure. And, 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 you know, he talks about, you know, we talk about being curious and, um, and he talks about, you know, practicing. Um, he'll, he'll, he'll talk about it several times about you are what you practice. And um, he's, he's a firm believer in that. And, and I mean, he even challenged you and I um, kind of off, air with with some homework and um i'm looking forward to doing it uh, this evening and um i think uh i would i would ask the listeners to uh be curious and and uh really listen to to what alan has to 
has to offer because it's a um, it's a great message. Enjoy our conversation with Alan Jager. Well, as we mentioned in the intro, we have Alan Jager with us this uh, this evening, and you know. We talked, you listeners will remember from last time we had our show last Friday that we mentioned what a sport Allen has been uh, in the fact that we were supposed to do this show actually last week. And as I mentioned on the show last week, I got really sick uh, and Allen had to get bumped, if you will. He was kind of the, what's the guy that Jimmy Kimmel always, oh, Matt, Matt Damon. Damon. Yeah. yeah. So Allen was our Matt Damon. So you'll take that movie, it. Alan. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take it, man. Anytime. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Alan, we're so happy to have you on here for a lot of reasons, because, you know, as we've gone down this path, this is, I guess, show will be show 48, I believe, 47 or 48, um, and dove into this Mental Advantage podcast. One of the things that we really had zeroed in as a, a list of guests, and we, you know, we had a whole host of names on there, and I'm happy to say that we've marked off quite a few of the ones that we had on that wish list. And we're marking off another one tonight because we definitely wanted to have you on this show because I think your approach, uh, Alan, what I've been most interested in is just your approach, especially as it relates to the breathing part of it, the meditative part of it, the visualization, all of that stuff. And we'll dive into that uh, has been something that's really resonated with me. But even beyond that, I think the the theme that I always hear you talking about, whether it's on some of your social media content or just on other podcasts, has been you got to practice this stuff, right? I mean, you have to practice, practice, practice. So first of all, if you would just dig dive into for some of the listeners, um, and you're probably used to doing this on shows, is maybe take us back to how you first got started into the whole idea of mental performance, mental skills, all of the things that we're going to be talking about this evening. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, congrats on all your shows, man. That's quite a, quite an accomplishment. And, uh, and, and really thanks for having me on, man. This is a wonderful platform. A- anytime you get a chance to share information about mental training, mental health, mental well-being, uh, it's, it's just, it's really cool. So I really appreciate you guys having me on and, and I appreciate being part of that list. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Man, I'm like, uh, I got goosebumps, man. Whatever, whatever this list is, is Matt Damon list? That's right. That's right. <laughs> we'll, we'll share it with you offline. That's right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that, um, and it's funny you use the word practice because I had a meeting today with some coaches and, well, I'll bring this up in a second about the word practice, but, you know, I was minding my own business. I've actually never said it this way, uh, telling my, my history. I was minding my own business. I was a junior at Cal State Northridge here in LA. And I had any, anything that was sort of suggesting this was going to happen, but I, I went through a very tough time mentally and, hmm. um, and it's a long story to get into, but essentially I didn't know what was going on with me. You know, I had some, some symptoms, some anxiety, some stressors, and I literally didn't feel like I had any history of any of this stuff. So it was all new to me. Essentially, I had to walk away from the team. And this was after um, the coaches brought me in um, at the end of fall ball. And, and I had a really good fall. I was a walk on. I had a great fall. And they basically said to me, which was weird because I'm thinking, I just want to make the team. Right. And they said something along the lines of, uh, do you see yourself as being sort of a closer or a starter? Uh, because in fall ball, I, I guess they got the feeling like I had a closer mentality, but it was, so long story short is I was on cloud nine. And from that moment, soon thereafter, I was involved with something that that's again, too long to get into, but it, it, it really threw me off. And um, so I was, I was at the highest high, which looking back or something to that, I was in really a great state mm-hmm. and eventually it led to some kind of a sabotage, which is sort of how I look back on it, but it really is a sabotage because it got me on my path. So mm-hmm. it's always now a silver lining, of course, but at the time it felt like I had sabotaged myself. And so I walked away for about six weeks. I saw a sports psychologist 
I was very lucky. He had a background in hypnotherapy. So I got into some other, you know, modalities of mental training. And, um, and I got to a point I was able to rejoin the team. I didn't pitch much after that, but um, it got me, it got the bug. Like, okay, what happened to me? Right. What's going on? I had no tools. I had no ideas. There wasn't an internet. And so uh, between the sports psychologists and just being curious, really, I guess is the key word. I fell into Zen. Um, and it's because of one of my, my mom's childhood friends, husband, who actually wrote the pilot to Kung Fu, uh, the series. On wow. TV. Yeah, it's a cool story. That's really cool. It is. It is. And, um, and he gave me a book that absolutely rocked my world called The Way of Zen by Alan Watts. And Alan Watts is known as really the foremost person. He was actually an Anglican minister in England. But he's sort of the first person known to really bring Zen from the East to the West. It's not mm -hmm. that it wasn't in books or written about, but he went to Japan and really embraced the culture, immersed himself into it. And I mean, he passed away in the 70s. And if you go onto YouTube, you will find countless talks that have half a million views or He's, he's really a, like, you know, in, in baseball terms, he's a legend. I mean, he's just, yeah. uh, he's just extremely well-respected and extremely witty and deep and funny. And so the way of Zen to me just radically shifted my world. And, and I, I know the sports psychologists and, and the stuff I went through there really helped lay the found work, uh, the groundwork. And so in a nutshell, that, studying Zen and getting heavy into meditation and spending four years writing a book when all I was doing was reading, researching, writing, and meditating. You know, I was like living like a monk in a way. And I got to a very, very deep place. I got to a place really what in Zen is called, you know, like no mind. I felt like I really was defaulting more to just the flow of life. And my thoughts were really secondary, which is a huge part of Zen is is you let the thoughts go and you focus more on instincts. So to bring it to the present is um, I was so inspired by this radical life-changing shift I had. There's no other way to put it. And I felt, you guys all know how it is when you, when you discover something. It could be a, a book. It could be an album. Nowadays, I don't call them albums. But uh, <laughs> it could be a new recipe. And you, you feel like a new exercise, like you want to share this with your, your family, your friends, people, because you feel like it's going to help them, right. which at the end of the day, I guess that's the ultimate goal of a teacher, right? Is we we're here to help. So I just felt like, man, I found something really magical, mystical, life transformative, and I wanted to share this. So that's why I wrote my book. And that's why I started as early as 1990 started doing private and, and private practice and private training with, with athletes, um, which of course, dealing with the athlete, you're actually dealing with the human being as we all know first, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's the athletes on the surface, too, but it's really the athlete. I mean, it's really the human. And uh, so 31 years later, I just feel like um, that's, you know, I, of course I got into other I'm pitching and arm development, but this whole idea of, of mental game and, and mental health and meditation, man, it's just such a core part of me. And so, you know, I guess in as short of time as I can, 31 years, that, that sort of gives you some, some idea of how I got here. So, so early on, cause, cause I mean, you're talking about the eighties and nineties, this, this whole aspect of the mental game was not as well received or, or, um, just it just wasn't around the way that it is today, and and even today, you know, we've talked to um, several clinicians and and you know on the podcast, and and there's still some reluctancy um, from athletes uh, and even coaches to to accept some of this. Have you found? Um, I mean, how has how has the paradigm kind of shifted over that? that 30, 31 years of, of kind of being into it. Cause you, you're, you are absolutely an early adopter to all of this. Brandon, it's a really great and important point in question because 
for people to have context of, of really this whole field, this whole world. Um, you know, when I first started, obviously there was the Ken Revises and the Bob Rotellas and mm -hmm. there were people doing it in the seventies and uh, probably earlier than that, they may not have called it sports psychology, but um, I think the main thing is when I first started, I was very frustrated because I had lived this at a deep, deep, deep level. Like I didn't just read about it and there's nothing against people that just read about it. But the fact that I had lived it and experienced it to the point where I had to walk away from my, my love, <laughs> baseball, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and navigate and work through that and, and spend four years pretty much around the clock, by the way. Uh, it, it took me four years to, to really get my book. Luckily, my mom was a writer who helped a ton. Um, but it was very frustrating because here I felt like, as we now know, 30 years later, like, hey, this is mainstream this is normal like you want to you want a better arm well you throw your long toss you do arm care you know you want a better mind you want a healthier quieter more relaxed more focused less distracted mind well you work on it it's not about whether you have a problem or not you just develop skills you enhance yourself as a human being that's all but as you as you mentioned brandon which is where you were going is yeah, in the, in the first 10, 15, even 20 years, but especially the first 10 years, it was like I had nine eyes or something when I walked into a room or met a player or met a coach. And I don't know, really, I don't blame them. I just think it was so new that unless you live this and knew this, the stigma was, yes, you had a problem. Like, yeah. stay away. You know, I, I don't have a problem. Like, Please don't right. talk to me. Right. And it started to loosen up. You know, it's funny. One of my first experiences with at the time, and he is a legend, but at the time I knew was a legend was Jerry Weinstein. And I went up to Sacramento City College in 1990. We, we tried to figure it out. It was early, 92, 93. My book wasn't written yet, so it was before 94. And I spent three days and I was lucky because when I got to his house, I asked him where, what hotel I was staying at. And he says, oh, no, no, you're staying here. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought early in my career, here's someone who I know is such a legendary coach and just gets it so deeply across the, the line of everything. And, uh, and here he was just totally acceptance and interested and allowing me to have three days with this program to just do mental training and mental education. My goodness. So it, you started feeling it open up, but I got to tell you, and then I'll, I'll move on so we can get to, get to the next topic. Oh, um, no. What was fascinating is it helped, you know, that I started writing for collegiate baseball in the late nineties, mid, mid to late nineties. Um, it helped that the internet came around and whatever, 2000, uh, Barry Zuto on a study right. on in like 2002. I spoke at the ABCA in 2003. You know, so granted, there were some things that helped along the way. Obviously, other people out there in the world are, are pushing mental training. Sports psychology was a department that might have been at Cal State Fullerton. Right, right. And maybe right. more other places in the world in the, in the 80s. And now, as you guys know, it's, it, it started popping up in, the, in, in maybe late 90s, 2000s. Now it's, it's everywhere. And so I guess to sort of get back to your point, Brandon, is that I would say in the last five years, especially 10, but really the last five, it's felt more than ever. Like this has just become mainstream. It's hard. It's almost like I'm not I'm afraid to say it, but you almost feel like, wow, has this really happened because of what I've right. been through and other people like myself in the in the 90s. And and now it's more of this feeling of just gratitude and appreciation that um, and gratification that this is mainstream, especially with COVID. Sure. It's like it's time. Like the research Absolutely. is done on the benefits of, of mental training and mental practice. So well, and uh, I, I yeah. remember how this, the success that Barry Zito had, right. And, and even I remember the articles talking about, oh gosh, you know, he's doing yoga and he's, he's into the Zen philosophy and he's, he's really, he's really pushing the envelope. Right. And you're thinking, hold on. If that was around, cause John and I talk about it all the time. If that was around back when we played, 
I mean, what, sign me uh, up <laughs> immediately. Knowing what I know now, it just absolutely. I head first, right? I mean, it just huge. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but that's the reason I am feeling so gratified, or, or really so just happy that knowing yeah. that um, this is normal now. This is mainstream. Yes. There may still be some players, some coaches, um, some parents who, I don't know, there might be some people that at first are kind of like, you know, what is this? And I, uh, but I, I feel like where it might have been 10 to 90% back in the day, it's great. It's hard to, it's hard to believe I can say this, but I feel like it's 90 to 10. And, and I really, I'm an optimist, but I really do feel like it's 100%. And I really do. I don't feel like there's a person that you can't meet. That even if they're a little bit resistant at first, within five minutes, they're not like, oh, that makes sense. Oh, the game is 90% mental or more, but I'm putting 0% of my time practicing the mental. Like, you can get it to them quickly. And, and fortunately, I just feel like there's just there's just momentum now, and it's just part of the culture. Well, and, and Alan, you, you brought up the book and I, you know, great book. And, and we want to tell everybody how to find that book. It's uh, getting focused, staying focused. And I have a question though, uh, because I want to get into some of that uh, here in a second, but you mentioned, you know, one of my favorite quotes is a Maya Angelou quote as, you know, I always did the best I knew how, when I knew better, I did better. And it, it makes me think about you and just evolution of not just, the mental game and what you've seen from, from early stages, right? I mean, you mentioned Ken Ravise and you mentioned Bob Rotello, but there, you know, that was, I mean, like you said, in the nineties, you started seeing a little bit more and more of this being adapted. And then you saw, you talk, Brandon talked about Barry Zito. How have you evolved as a instructor, as a coach, if you will, of that mental game? I mean, are, you know, thinking about what I just said about my Angelo, what are you doing things you feel like you've evolved in your philosophies towards these, uh, you know, some of the, the information you're trying to get across to players now? Yeah, I think number one, I'm just a lot more cut to the chase um, in, a, in a very diplomatic kind way. But right. I just feel like from 30 years of doing this now and, and 30 years of feedback and 30 years of seeing it implemented, um, I'm just a lot more. I feel like natural passion. It's not like a sales job anymore. I feel like it just, it's just more like, Hey, this, this is real. And, um, and I think the other area is that um, I've always felt that meditation, the mental practice part is the most important piece. But now I, I think I, I talk about it on a, on a completely different level, even more. So it's just, I just feel like it's where the rubber hits the road. At the same time, um, to answer your question, I feel like I've sort of dwindled down the whole strategic part or what we call game management. I feel like I've yeah. dwindled that down really to one major theme, which is the process. And I know it's a very popular word. Mm-hmm. It's sort of our spin on the process and, and sort of how it relates to simplifying the mental game. So I feel like that's changed a lot in the last 10 years. I've really simplified the, the quote unquote game management approach. And that could be baseball, golf, tennis, hockey. Um, it's all universal. It's life. Right. So I think really in a nutshell, John, um, I would just say that. And also maybe the last thing I'll say is this. I've always meditated, meaning I've, I've been very consistent for the most part for 30 years as, as someone who meditates basically daily. Um, But I also feel like the last year, year and a half, I've sort of rededicated myself to to maybe a a deeper level. And I feel like it's really important because, you know, you become what you practice, which is the word I mentioned earlier, the five five of the most important words I've ever heard. And that's from Dr. Shana Shapiro. And I feel like it's important as someone who talks about this, not to guilt trip anybody out there, but I just feel (laughs) like that. Um, if you're going to talk about something, whether it's the strategic part of it or whether it's the practical part of it, it just helps a lot to to be living it. Um, and it doesn't mean if someone ever meditates, they can't talk about mental practice. But I just I can only speak for myself. It it really makes a difference. Um, 
having my own practice and, 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 and really working on the depths of that, uh, because I feel like that that helps me be more effective, more efficient. Um, and I feel like on an energy level, I've always felt this energetically. It's like people see through things consciously or unconsciously. And I just feel like when you're speaking from experience, it's not like you're trying to sell them again. They, they feel it. They, they feel that, that, um, that deep authenticity, if you will. So I think those are the things that have changed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it's interesting because, you know, you, you, you mentioned something earlier, Alan, about um, being curious, right? And it's, yeah. it's one of the things that we talk about too um, with, with other professionals that have, that, um, at, who was it, John, was it, um, Pazic, that, you know, one of the things that, that, Tyler Pazic. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that he says, and, and I have, I have started to ask my kids cause I still coach, um, football and baseball, just show up to practice being curious, like just be open to whatever, whatever we're doing. Um, and, and I'm going to try as, as the leader of this event to be intentional with what we're doing, right? And it's, it's interesting um, to hear you talk about being intentional with your practice, having the 30 years of, of experience and being able to say, look, I'm giving you the answers to the test, right? We can, we can cut to the chase. Um, but how, for our listeners, how does somebody start down the road of, of meditating and how do they start to practice? How does someone be open and curious, but where, where is that first step on the path? Boy, the first step is uh, awareness. Okay. Um, if someone has awareness that, Hey, I'm curious and I'm interested, man, that's 95% of the game. Really the, the fact that they're curious and interested. And I, and I do love the word curious. Um, so once they get to that point, well, first of all, the internet, there's just, there's countless resources as we all know. So um, it's not hard to find the resources, but I would say that um, talk to a coach, talk to a parent, talk to a local yoga instructor, a martial arts instructor, whoever, doctor, attorney, and just say, Hey, are you, are you familiar with anybody that's done some form of meditation or any uh, meditation teacher? Um, if nothing else, go to YouTube, keyword breathing exercises, keyword meditation, keyword relaxation, keyword guided meditation. Um, and as you know, you can sample a lot of stuff. You can find a ton of books, you know, how to meditate. Um, just because if you're listening to this podcast, you know, obviously we have a book. Absolutely. But there's countless books out there. Um, but at the end of the day, I think being curious and being aware is step one, of course. And step two, it's it's really about if you're if you are curious, it's just about jumping in. I mean, really, that's the that's the end of that's at the end of the day. This is about if you want to try it, try it. And I guess I will add one piece, which is if you're gonna try it and you're interested, you know, give it a good week. Don't try it once, do it every day for a week. Start out with something that's very simple and achievable, you know, maybe a 10-minute breathing exercise. I can give someone right now in five seconds a, a beginning exercise. You know, you can count inhale one and, and exhale two and just count to 50 or 20 or count to 10 five times in a row and just see if you can stay with your numbers. And the other piece to that exercise would be to know that if any thoughts come in your mind, they're not right or wrong. They're not good or bad. You know, the goal of the meditation is not to push them away or block them out. It's to let them be. And just keep your attention where you want it. In this case, it's counting your breath, or it could be laying on the beach, or it could be floating in the sky. So there's a starting meditation for someone. But I think really to answer your question, Brandon, it comes back to, boy, if you're aware of it, you're already there. Now it's a question of you, if, you're, if you really want to do it, just do it. Just jump in, give it a try. Um, but the resources, I just think there's so many. And of course, like anything you have to do a little research to find what works for you. Sure. But I just, I just think nowadays yeah, there's so much out there. Well, I think Alan, one of the things that I like about your approach so much and what's attracted me to that 
mindset is everybody, and you mentioned this earlier in the mental game, you see all these mental performance coaches now, and it's, this is not a knock on any of them, but everything is about the actual strategy. It's about, you know, you mentioned the process, whether it's also um, working on being present moment focused, all of those, you know, kind of catchphrases that we're starting to hear neutral thinking, all of that stuff is great. But what you're saying, which I really want the listeners to understand, is you have to practice before you even get to that point. Like that's that's step two. Like all of these different things that you talk about being out on the field as an athlete and recognizing, having that awareness to recognize when you're not present moment focused, like being able to get yourself back into that, being able to prepare for the game management piece takes a lot to do, you know, it takes that meditation, it takes the breathing, it takes the visualization, all those things. Like that's the piece we are not saying, Hey, this is replacing that. It's saying this is step one in the process of, if you can get good at, at kind of, you know, I I said this uh, comment on last week's show, but I love it. It's from Mark Glassini. And I know he took it from somebody else, but he said, everywhere you go, there you are. And it's like this, this thought process of you've got to get comfortable with yourself and in that inner space before you can then go and do some of these other things that you're talking about. Well, it's one of the most important things you could bring up, honestly, in the mental game. And I'm glad you met, you know, you brought it up because that's why I say mental training and meditation is where the rubber hits the road. Because you have to first start with, as you said, you have to first be in tune with what is it like to just sit here and be quiet for five minutes? And maybe for the first time in my life, I love the word intentionally, Brandon, sit here intentionally to just notice what my thoughts are doing, not to act on them Mm -hmm. or what my body's feeling. Like that's a very profound form of meditation to just sit and watch and notice. And there's the word again, be curious. Mm -hmm. Because if you can do that for five or 10 minutes and then you start noticing, oh, there's things happening, like there's thoughts going up, but I'm learning how to now be neutral to the thoughts. I'm learning how to now not engage thinking. I'm learning now how to let things settle and get quiet. Well, these are all profound skills that you're developing. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing I think people don't realize until you, you, until you meditate is that you're putting yourself in a position, not where you're sitting at a, at a street light or a stop sign or the market or on the phone or on Twitter. You're actually intentionally sitting somewhere where you don't have anything going on purposefully so that you can now evaluate or notice what's happening. Oh, my mind is doing this. Or my mind is doing that. What's a more, more effective way to change my habits or programming or neural pathways? Okay, well, I know being quiet and being relaxed is a good thing. So let me see if I can work on that. So the point is, is that it's so important to have that inner landscape as you were averting to, John. I don't know if averting to, we'll we'll say directing toward Mm -hmm. (laughs) that inner landscape so that I can become someone now that understands what it's like to be clear, relaxed, focused, present. If distractions come up, thoughts come up, worries come up, the future comes up, the past comes up, I have an I, I have a feeling of like, oh, wow, it's all coming up. But now I'm not I'm not taking that dance, right? right? I'm not getting on that merry-go-round. I'm actually just watching it. It's like the umpire watching a tennis match. I'm not going back and forth with these thoughts, and I'm not getting on that, which which maybe happens when I'm at a red light or happens when I'm on the phone. There, there's a lot of, I don't know, the research says this, this, we have approximately seventy thousand thoughts a day. Well, chances are, if you're in the middle of the day, you're a lot more vulnerable to a lot of stuff going on versus when you're just sitting quiet where you're intentionally waiting for it and watching for it where Mm -hmm. you can work on it. So in a nutshell, I love that point because it's sort of like you have to take care of your inner landscape. You've got to water your plants so they grow and get strong and strong and strong. And then, yes, when we take this out into the world or for an athlete out to the field, We're coming from that place of inner connection, inner awareness, inner harmony that we've worked hard on to build, as opposed to getting some great strategies out on the field, but not doing this inner landscape first, 
and someone's saying, hey, stay in the present moment. Hey, take a deep breath. Great advice. But if you haven't done this inner work, and right. the mind is used to defaulting to, yeah, but there's a GM in the stands today. Yeah, there's yeah. three recruiters in the stands today. Yeah, my batting, I'm hitting 299, and I really need a hit to get to 300. If that's your default, because you're just used to how your mind is looking at life, because maybe as human beings, we're susceptible to drama without this inner practice. It's so important to get that inner world. Yeah. And and the problem, Alan, is so many times people think the answer to all of that, what happens if they skip the breathing, they skip the meditation, they skip the visualization, that default becomes, well, when those thoughts come into my head, I'm just going to push them out. And it doesn't work that way. You have to accept that the thoughts there, I but just choose not to act on it. Like I'm not going to allow that to become something that goes even further. I'm not going to let that thought about the GM then trickle into a thought about if I don't do successful, if I'm not successful in this performance today, I'm not going to get my shot that I wanted. I've been training all my life to get or whatever. Like that's that merry-go-round, that not merry-go-round, but that's that roller coaster, if you will, that happens. And so that's why I think a lot of times people will, you know, th- when they get into that mindset of like, oh, I just push these out. It's called mental, mental toughness to some people is just pushing things out, right? It's not accepting it and understanding it. Brandon. But what, what Alan, what I love that, that you're talking about, Alan, is as an athlete, and, and, and we kind of mentioned it right before kind of coming on, what Alan's talking about for the listeners is, is you have an opportunity as an athlete to create your own zone, right? We, we, as an athlete, you always felt so empowered when you happen to fall into this unconscious, I, I, you know, I, I knew, so So for me, it's very funny. Like I knew when I was doing well, because when I would step to the plate, I would be trying to spell these really crazy words in my head. And this guy's, you know, getting ready to throw a, a 92 mile an hour slide piece at my ankle. And I'm I'm at the, in the batter's box trying to spell the word Q, right? I'm going Q, U, E, U, E. And, and you're just reacting. And, and what, what, those were always special just periods as of an athlete. And what, what I'm hearing, Alan, is that, hey, you, you can kind of create some of that if you will allow yourself to take care of yourself and, and the landscape that you're talking about, right? Um, yeah, I'll give you a, um, a cool line that I, um, I really like, which is the zone – because you use the word zone. Mm-hmm. The zone is always happening. The question is, are you thinking about anything that's taking you out of it? So if you're already in the zone, and I would use the, the word zone for just flow, just life. It's sort of like you get lost in a great song or a great movie. You're basically in the zone. You're, you're, lo- you're gone. There's no, mm-hmm. There's actually no subject and object anymore. You're just sort of immersed. And, um, and the reason that's important for people to understand is that if you don't have a mental practice where you can spend time cultivating that natural space that's inherent, you're born with it. It's just who you are when you're not thinking, basically. So we can use a different word than zone. We can use the word being. We can use the word awareness. We can use the word right. flow. We can use the word instinct. But it's there. And so now the idea is that if I have a, med- a meditation practice every day, I can spend time being more intimate with that space. And then I hear thoughts coming in that are taking me out of it. I can get better at being neutral and just mm-hmm. staying in the word I was going to use that you were mentioning earlier, because my business partner, uh, shout out to Jim Batcher, when you know he played for 14 years, um, he would call it he, whenever he was in his own bubble. Mm-hmm. In fact, just for him, I use the word bubski. It's an inside <laughs> joke. He would be in his own bubble. And so whether you use the word zone, bu- bubble, tunnel vision, locked in, the, the point is, is that if you, it's not, it's not that if you don't have a practice, you can't experience that. It just means that if you have an intentional practice and that this cultivates that state and that space that's already there, mm-hmm. it helps so much when you go out in the world to sort of 
take that with you as you will, as opposed to if you don't have a practice in there and you have 70,000 thoughts a day or whatever they are, and there's so much drama out there in the world, it would make sense that it's a lot easier to get caught up on that merry-go-round. It's a lot easier to, to ruminate with mm-hmm. thoughts and distractions in the future and the past. So um, I, I used this earlier with a conference, with a Zoom call I had with coaches today. It's a great, you, you guys will love it. It's a great Zen line, which is enlightenment is like an accident. The more you meditate, the more accident prone you become. Mm-hmm. And, and you could substitute for enlightenment, you can substitute the zone, mm-hmm. you know, or peak performance, you know, peak performance, the zone is like an accident. The more you, it's not a, it's not trying to necessarily be a causal thing on purpose. Like if you do A, you get B. It's more of just saying that, because I like the idea of accident prone. That's more of a thing that just happens. And I just feel like the idea of just being in practice, it's like that five, those five words, I'm telling you, they're the five of the best words I've ever heard in my life. You become what you practice. Yep. And if you want to be quieter and more relaxed and more in tune and more in a flowy state and more intuitive and more instinctive and more present practice it. Yeah. So Alan talking about practicing visualization, cause we've gotten this question before on our show. I'm curious what your thoughts are about what types of things you should be visualizing. And what I mean by that is negative, positive, how to get out of the negative, how to, you know, how to deal with adversity, visual, visualizing that, how to, am I just visualizing always positive things, hitting the home run, getting the base hit in the bottom of the ninth? Where, where do you stand with that? I think visualization one day, like meditation, here I am speaking from 1990 to now, I don't, things are happening a lot faster as we know now. I got to believe meditation, some type of breathing exercise, some type of visualization would be part of elementary school courses. I just do. I feel like it's mm-hmm. coming. The research is too strong on the benefits, the mental health connection now with what's going on in the world. So visualization, even though I haven't talked about it a lot, it is chapter six of my book is called the mental training chapter. So I go into the whole gambit from getting into the right frame of mind to the breathing lead up into, and then I talk about imagery. I talk about visualization. Visualization to me is extremely powerful um, because your body believes you're doing it as if you're doing it. Right. Mm-hmm. I can visual and I'll, and then I'll give you more of your answer about what to do uh, or how to do it. If I make 10 pitches on the black at shin height, wherever I want to put the glove in my mind, and you can argue also if I go through, you know, really nice fluid mechanics and I I finish well, I I do everything perfectly. And then that last part, which we call lanes, which I'll jump back into in a second. If I do 10 out of 10, my muscle memory, so to speak, my neural pathway, so to speak, has just measured that and has gone through as if I actually did it. So I have now strengthened that muscle memory. Groove is a word I like. I've grooved that muscle memory mm-hmm. 10 out of 10 times. So that's, that's where I, I feel like the term locked in comes from. Mm-hmm. The groove gets so hot that there's that mag- magne- magnetization, magnetizing mm-hmm. effect. We'll go with that word. <laughs> there's that pull. So when you're locked in, as you guys, I'm sure have all, we've all experienced it, where we feel we're being pulled. It's so strong. Even as a hitter, you feel the ball is going, coming into your zone oh, yeah. because whatever re- somehow you're pulling that energy. But anyway, so 10 out of 10 times, I can strengthen the grooving. I would argue this is all happening neurologically as well. I don't know a lot of research on this, but I believe this is a neurological happening, physiological. If I'm Greg Maddox, on a perfect day, I might hit my perfect spot three or four times, maybe five. Now, the other five, you could say two or three might miss by two inches. Two might miss by four inches and one might miss by six inches. That's like one of the best ever. 
So what I'm saying is if you take an, a, a typical high school or college pitcher, even a professional pitcher, those numbers are going to be much different, right? Sure. So any pitch that's not perfectly in my spot, I'm going to call mixed muscle memory, mixed messaging. So my body has, even if it's close, and if it's still sort of a strike and unhittable, I, it, it works. But my point is that if you have two perfect pitches out of 10, three pretty close, three not so close, and two way away, that's sending mixed muscle memory. So the reason visualization is so powerful is I can groove. I can throw a 500 pitch bullpen. What am I normally going to be able to pitch 50 pitch bullpen or whatever it is, 45, unless you're in Japan, then you can do a lot more. <laughs> so I can groove exact muscle memory is my point. And so my body starts measuring that and feeling that that's why visualization A is so important. B as far as what to do. I use the term lanes a lot. I love lanes. I did it. I played until I was 45. I love these lanes. They work both as a pitcher and a hitter. They work on a four foot foot. They work on a 150 yard iron. It doesn't matter. Lanes are lanes. You can say lines, funnels, tunnels, lights. From the release point to the literal E and Easton on the glove, specifically is a lane. So what I had my pitchers do and what I would do is I would do a lot of lane work. So for forcing fastball, my lane is from release point straight to the, you know, to the point to the E and Easton. But my breaking ball would be the hitter's left hand uh, elbow, the right hand hitter's left elbow. Because I knew if I started my curveball at that spot, it would go to the outer third at shin height, per se. And I can move that spot, of course, depending upon if I want to be more center or more left. My point is this. I got to a point as a pitcher where if I got a fastball, I was a four-seam fastball guy. So if I got a fastball, I always knew right away my brain started, started shooting that target out if I did a lot of visualization. It would literally like shoot a beam out. Now I was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because there was that pull from doing the lanes. There was the pull because I physically have done it a million times, even if it was, wasn't always perfect. Mm -hmm. but if I did a lot of visualization, like before the game, there would be a feeling of like my curveball, I had a lane, my changeup, I had a lane, my cutter, I had a lane. So even if it started here and ended up there, it's even if it bends, it's a lane and it's a white light. And then here's the last thing. It's more advanced, but at some point that white light, you do it on a black background. So the contrast is greater, mm -hmm. which is why we all have a batter's eye, right? Sure. At every major and minor league field, it, it heightens the ball. Mm -hmm. Hitting is the same thing. That's reverse. It's the release point to the point of contact on the bat. Now, yes, you can see the, 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 the contact of the bat. You can see the lane of where you want to take it because that all reverse engineers to make your mechanics sync up. All this visualization, by the way, it's amazing. It helps physically sync up too. <laughs> So as one example, lanes, hitting lanes, pitching lanes, whether again, it's the examples I gave you, again, we can work lanes, putting it. I've played golf almost my whole life. These things are money. It helps so much in putting as well. So anyway, that's a, a little background of visual. Can, Alan, can you tie it in as a hitter? You made me think about this is if I'm taking BP physically now, I'm not in that visual state anymore, but I'm out there taking BP and I'm going through my first round of five or whatever. Can I trick my mind for a, a lack of a better way to say this of, and I, I seem the ball at contact, I make contact and maybe I just visualize it going somewhere like the ball is going to go where it's going to go. But can, I mean, have you known anyone to kind of mix the two of those things together, that visualization after the actual, um, you know, preparation or practice part of that? It goes back to what we talked about earlier, the inner landscape first, then to the outer. So if someone has been is meditating every day and clearing their mind and getting in a relaxed state and getting in a very happy, peaceful state, and then we're implanting on top of that, these grooves, these white lights, these lanes. And now all of a sudden they're doing this every day to where they're getting hundreds and hundreds of reps every day. And they're, they're seeing the ball so well in their lane that in BP, they're not even swinging anymore on pitches that are not in that lane. I can right. tell you a story about the Cape in a second about how <laughs> I got some people mad at me because our hitters were not BP is supposed to kind of go. Right. Know, 
So I guess really the bottom line, John, is that if you plant these suckers in there, you put the files in the computer, then whether it's BP or the game, I call them hot. I call them green lights versus red lights. I actually have an article called Batter's Box Management that does drills. And the idea that the mind gets so sculpted that it's hunting these green lights or lanes, the hot spots, kind of like you see now on TV. And then, the, and then literally the mind tells the arms and hands to shut down on balls, on pitches that are not in those hot spots. And so the mind just starts hunting these hot areas. It's the magnet all over again. Of that. Fact. Yeah. But let's say you did a bunch of visualization at, you know, it, it, 3.30 and then your game wasn't until 6.30 and you, you did a little bit between pregame and the game and, you know, you just keep firing. You know, the other thing is the more you visualize, the more you groove it, it's like a lot of things. You may not need to do a ton before the game, but let's just say you had a you swung in a bad pitch so you mixed some muscle memory. And so before your next at bat, you're like, look, I got to early in the count. I got to look fastball in or fastball. I got to, I got to get those two lanes, right? So you just do a little bit of inner third, outer third. You see the result the way you want it. So that would be my way of maybe prepping right before, even in the cages before the game, let's say you take a round. It wasn't great. Maybe you were distracted. So you have a you have a little bit of time before you go up again. That would be a great time to you know take a couple breaths, get back onto the lanes. Then your next round of BP, just trust that it, it should be a lot hotter. Yeah, no, I love that. I think that's really really good. I'm I'm just for the listeners, Brandon and I are like writing notes down feverishly as Alan's talking. It, it's it's <laughs> one of those things that that honestly it it it's almost aggravating that I'm just now at yep. 48. And you're going, damn it. Like, yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's, he started doing this at 91. We were, we were still playing. He, where were you? He so was out on the West Coast. I needed him. Yeah. Well, he was yeah. still yeah. playing. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was, yeah. No, go ahead. Old go ahead. AOL. E, 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 e. <laughs> it had taken 45 minutes to download the, whatever the article. I mean, yeah. No, it was before that. Think yeah. about it. When I first started writing for collegiate baseball, Mid nineties, late nineties, there, there was no internet. When my book came out, there was no internet. Um, I mean, it's really hard to imagine that the internet is only whatever, yeah. 20 years old. I mean, it feels yeah. like it's been around forever, but, um, but I just, just because of visualization, I know you guys as baseball guys are going to love this story and I, I will keep it quick so we can get, move on. Yeah. 1992, still writing my book. I went to Chatham with Rich Hill, who is now at Hawaii, but was at USD forever and USF. Okay. And he's one of my dear friends uh, forever. Um, first real quote unquote kind of job slash internship I did in 1992 at Cal Lutheran. I was around the team pretty much the whole year. And that's one of the reasons, the main reason I ended up going to the Cape with them. And I went to the Cape really just to hang out for a couple of weeks and I ended up becoming a coach and doing meditation with the guys out there and uh, helping out. But the hitters that I worked on, um, these lanes that we're talking about, um, got to a point where during BP, and it's funny because the BP pitcher, if he's listening, Dave Taylor, at some point, shout out. Uh, we, were, we, we, we actually were roommates in the same room. So that's how close we were. John Schiffner, by the way, was an assistant coach at the time, and he was in a different part of the house. I, and the reason I say this is because John Schiff, as we call him, has broken the record for most wins in the cage. So I like to tell people, hey, I need shift before when he was just an assistant <laughs> coach. <laughs> right. So Dave would throw BP, mostly Dave. And our guys bought in. They loved these drills. Um, and they got to a point where they were, and I know in BP it's a little tricky because, you know, you do have to move on. You have so many minutes and so many swings. But they got to a point, first of all, I had them taking the first pitch of every round so they can work more on their state of mind and, and being. That's, that's part of the article that I'll send you to Batter's Box Management. But they got so good at just, and I, and I told them in BP, you know, let's broaden the plate, not, not just these luxury count pitches we're looking for, but they got so good at quitting on balls that were, even if they were just a ball up or a ball down, especially a ball out or in, that really, they could crush it. 60 miles an hour. Sorry, Dave, at 84 <laughs> miles an hour. No, power, no, I mean, we all threw 60. Right. It's, look, right, at 45 right. feet, 60 is 90. So, That's so, it. For sure, for sure. And Dave, by the way, as a side note, 
really good BP pitcher. And now he was a catcher. He had a good arm. So he actually did throw firm. Um, so I'm, Dave, I'm going to give you at least 90. <laughs> <laughs> but he started, you know, he started coming to me like, hey, like, can we, you know? Right. <laughs> and I'm like, Dave, what can I do? They're, they're practicing skills that are leading them to locking in their lanes and, and, and staying off of pitches that in the game they can unconsciously now that three, one pitch that we all see a little up and we all want to crush. That is a pop-up or a swing through all of a sudden now is a take and the guys walk in the first base. I mean, the three, one pitch that's not middle out to where you can go right center and do some damage, but it's more on the black or bit maybe off the play a little bit, but we're all anxious because it's close. And then we roll over or we, we hit off the end of the bat, comebacker. These are these brutal. Yeah. Versus we're taking pitches now and we're getting walks. And not only that, these guys earlier in the count, maybe fastballs, middle in, middle, middle out, drivable pitches. You know, you just felt like they were they were engaged. So um, it's just a funny story to think that it got to a point these guys got so good at it that it affected absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Especially he's, in BP, he's like, Come on, yeah, man. he's like, "Let's go." I only got so many pitches left in my arm. I was a catcher. You, I mean, I, I, I'm guilty as anybody being like, "My guy, come on!" I'm like, I'm, yeah. I'm up here grinding for you, yeah, and and, and I'm getting old, and it, 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 we gotta, I gotta get some of the J bands to, uh, to make there sure that I'm, I'm taking right. care of my keep arm. the old shoulder in in, in place. I, I tell pitching. Care. Honestly, I tell BP pitchers, first of all, because you're making so many volume throws with low impact, mm -hmm. it's a great conditioning. So BP pitchers tend to last forever because of it. But especially for the three or four weeks leading up to coming back to school again, unless you pit, you know, you throw BP year round, it, it is actually a game changer. If you start doing band work yeah. three, four times a week, five, six times a week leading up to that, that first day, you're already off with a good base. You recover well and you start getting into a good cycle right away. But it, it really, I know it is, it's a catch 22 because we want them to get their swings in. We have limited time. The pitcher's got so many, you know, you got to take care of him. But look, going back to my example of mixed muscle memory versus grooving the muscle memory, it makes all the sense in the world. Like it does. even if you got 10 less hacks out of 40 or 30, if those 20 hacks were pure and you really attack balls that were in those lanes that you're working on and you're grooving and you stayed off of those other 15, Joe, sorry, but it just reminds me of one of my favorite stories ever. Joe DiMaggio. Um, I heard this 12th hand probably, but uh, supposedly during spring training one year, there was a young kid in the stands and Joe was out there by himself Um and he had a bucket of balls. And I guess he just wanted to take some extra swings. No one was around. Maybe he was getting away from the press. I don't know. This young kid was out there and Joe said, hey, do you mind throwing me some BP? And of course, the kid was probably very, very nervous. because You know, he's probably already a legend at that point. And the kid out of like 100 balls through like five pitches that Joe actually swung at, five strikes. And the kid went up to him afterward. He kept apologizing. He kept apologizing. Joe said, oh, no, 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 no. That was awesome. You know, I got to swing at the pitches I needed to, and I got to practice taking the pitches versus how do most hit. I know as a hitter, right. we go up in BP and we mean well, but we got a bat in our hands and the ball's coming 65 miles an hour, and we can do damage on pitches that are out of the zone. Absolutely. And so it's a great – You're grooving it the other way. I mean, well, that's exactly right. And it's one of those things, Alan, you remind me of – when I work with college hitters or I'm talking to college teams, I'll ask the question a lot of times, especially as I know I'm starting to work myself towards visualization and imagery. And I'll say, how many at-bats you get a game? And they'll be like four, three. And I'm like, mm, I think you can get a lot more than that. I mean, if you think about it, you know, if you just did tw the 27 outs that you're going to get, right? I mean, if the other guy threw a perfect game, that's 27 ABs that you can get visually other than the ones that you're actually a participant in. I mean, there are so many more times even beyond just that, you know, when you're kind of getting that groove in, but just watching and, and participating visually just through somebody else is a really good opportunity for you as well. Yeah, and you can look. 
it's happening more and more. You know, Jason Bay went through the entire PGA about four years ago when he won it. Um, and I mean, he still does it, but on that particular day, and it really was more like those for, for months leading up to it. He took, I mean, an extended five, six, seven. I mean, that's a long time on air. <laughs> he has eyes closed before every shot. Yeah. And um, you saw McGuire doing it back in the day. Um, I just feel like, again, this is something that's going to become very, very normal. You know, I, I don't remember. It was Bobby Jones. Um, but one of the, the legends was known, supposedly, he, he would – be in his room the night before a round and he would go through the entire course i believe jack nicholas maybe because he picked up on that okay but again like you said it's, it's not three or four at bats um i can not only work on pitches that i want to take advantage of but i can work on pitches that are getting me in trouble like yeah. just, here's one quick example if i'm right-handed and i'm having a hard time with a backdoor curveball from a lefty because i don't get to see that very much right I can write, we can write it now, do 50 of those. 50. Yeah. Like where I mean, literally, you can get set up in the box. You can get how you want to get. You can get the picture on the mound with the background, however you want. You can literally, you can actually have them throw a few, just, just, just take a few and then do 50. I guarantee you, if you did 50 in a row right now, we put a left hander out there right now with a backdoor curveball. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect right away. It's going to be a different experience. For sure. Absolutely. Hey, Alan, how do you know when you're locked in? And, and what I mean by that is, are you locked in when you have no more thoughts that are entering in? Um, or is it when you have them, you're dealing with them, you're managing those thoughts? I, I, I think about this because one of the things when we had Sheets on recently, who I know is a good buddy of yours, Jeremy Sheetinger, he was saying how, and he even shared this with you. He said, you know, I got to a point where I was so dialed into every pitch of every game that it took a while to like come out of it. He said it was like three or four days after the, you know, after we had won where you're like, wow, I got to snap out of this. Like I'm so locked into this thing right now. Well, we're going to go deep with that question. That's a deep, <laughs> deep question. I like it. Yeah. Here's, here's what I got. Um, I would say by definition, if you're locked in, you're in the zone. You're so immersed that you're not aware that you're immersed. Now we can argue there's something going on or on some level vibrationally, you, you know what's going on, but I would say in a way, ultimately you don't. One definition of the zone for me uh, or being locked in, we'll use that term, is the disillusion of subject and object. So the dissolving, so there's no more me and you. There's no more me in the game. Again, I use the simple analogy, getting on a bike and riding, surfing in a way where you're, you're no longer feeling like the wave is doing it or I'm riding the wave. So there's tons of analogies about that where you really just, the fuel becomes the fire, right? You, it just becomes. So I would say by definition, if you're in it, there's nothing's happening as far as there's no thought process. There's no correcting. It's just, it's going. Now you can say someone's in the zone. Something happens like, um, you know, you walk a guy or you, you give a home run and then you're kind of like, now you're thinking about something and then you can use something corrective to say, oh, wait, that's okay. It's just a home run. Let me come back to my process and come back to my breathing. And then you can be back in the zone again. Um, the deep part of this question is this, maybe because I'm in the field, maybe because I've been meditating so long. Um, I still play tennis three times a week. I still play golf. And I've had, because I've re rededicated myself to my own meditation practice, and I've really worked more on things we're talking about, like the, the, the disillusion of subject and object, more of this feeling of what I, you know, what I've, boundlessness, right? Kind of how do you feel like when you're locked in the game? How do you feel like when you're immersed in a movie, immersed in a song? You're, you know, you're watching a sunset and you're just gone. And so my meditation practice is a lot of that is, is that Zen, no mind, just sort of being. So I've noticed I've played sports where I've been aware that I am flowing, but I've been aware that I'm aware of it. But I also know when I have that moment that I'm aware of it, 
either stay in that playful state with it, don't think about it, or just keep going. The great Sanskrit word, T-Z-U dash J-A-N, Chujan. It, it means loosely spontaneity. It really is sort of means the action of like a, a flower growing. We can say, well, there was a before, during, and after, but according to nature, it just it just grows, <laughs> right? It's like the universe is just made, it's just, it's just expanding. So there's not like, it's not trying to grow. It's just happening. And so to me, when, I've been, when I feel that state, I feel like if I notice it, I just want to go back into Chujan. Another way of saying Chujan is leap into action. That's another Zen idea. You just leap in, you just go which just forces you into, into instinct, into feel, right? So my point is, by definition, I would say the, the, the being locked in or being in the zone is literally the absence of, thought, absence of thought, the absence of time, the absence of pretty much everything. It's just, you're along for the ride, okay? But I brought up this other point because yes, kind of where you were going, where the things happen to where you're maybe in the zone or locked in, and maybe you need to do some things to, if you come out of it a bit, because a lot of times if people are in the zone and they come out of it, they don't really know why they got in. They don't know why they came out. They just hope they're back in at some point, you know? Right. So to give you a couple of ideas, yes. Um, if you feel like you're, you're in a great space and you've come out of it, then yes, if you can do something very simple and corrective um, just to get out back out of the thought world again and just sort of drop back into where you were because it's going remember this we talked about this earlier it's very very important principle it's happening anyway the river is always flowing mm -hmm. it's always going it's not an ego thing like oh i'm in the zone it's just I, I call this more nature you're born with it it's just natural it's your natural state that's the zen part i love this yes the zone and locked in and these are all grandiose terms and understandably so because it feels very special when you're right in it. but it's special the point is is that if it's always there it's always available our job then is, is to spend more time being accessible to it back to the meditation yep Why i like that, that so important no, I, I like that because it's, and I love the idea that it's, it's there, it's just something we have to find and be available to. Um, and, and I think that's a really, really cool thing for the listeners, because to Brandon's point earlier, I think there's a lot of people that are going to hear this episode and they're going to be like, man, this really is something that I'm, I'm wanting to do. I feel like it's the next, ironically, I'm going to say this, the evolution of where they are from a mental performance standpoint, when we know that it should have been probably a, a prequel, right? Not the sequel, but the right. prequel. Yeah, it's, it should have been <laughs> yeah. the foundation. Block, yeah. Like, like yeah. Alan mentioned earlier, right? I mean, it's, but it's I, the groundwork of the, the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. But I think a lot of people though, and you've probably seen this, Alan, they do put, put it as a postscript. It's like the next, all of the other strategies that are in place. Uh, but it's really something, hopefully the listeners and, and guys, you all can find on YouTube. I mean, Alan's got so many different resources. You can go to jagersports.com. You can look at the resources he has there. You can go on YouTube. You can follow Alan on Twitter. Um, I know that Alan, and I believe I saw this on the Jager Sports website. It's the mental health manual, the, the what, why, how approach. Is that something that was on jagersports.com? I remember seeing that somewhere um but it was a kind of like a companion journal for some of these um things so you know again maybe just another resource that i stumbled upon uh in looking for um you know all of the things that you've been doing the art of quiet i know is is something i saw it's a i thought was really really well done that was the video um that that was done and i think i found that on youtube that was really, really uh, well put together. Was that a friend of yours that kind of got into uh, like a production company or something like that? Yeah, his name is Paul Tremlin, also a Cal State Northridge graduate. He's out in Kansas City now, and he runs, uh, I can't remember the name of his 
you got a very nice academy there, but they prioritize mental training, mental skill. But he he's fallen in love with storytelling and video and movies. And so um, he was out in L.A. and wanted to put this together. And he, as you can see, the art of quiet. I mean, I I it's pinned on our Twitter handle I, from a, over a year ago now. It's uh, I just love it. I thought he did such an amazing job. And then real quick on the mental health manual. So it's a great time to give a shout out to our VP, China McCarney. Mm-hmm. China um, has dealt with some mental health stuff as well. And he started his own foundation, Triple AD Athletes Against Anxiety and Depression. And um, awesome resources. He's written a couple of books. He most recently came out with this mental health manual and companion workbook. All proceeds from that, by the way, go back into mental health charities. That's and awesome. China has lived this for like the last five or six years. It was started with panic attacks. And, you know, this is all pre-COVID. And the fact now that with COVID, um, I mean, let's face it, the more resources we have and the more it's okay to talk about, you know, I mean, we're talking a lot about more of the enhancement side and the developmental side of mental training. But as we all know, there's a lot going on out there as far as mental health and, um, you know, the Simona Biles of the world and the loves of the world. I mean, they're godsends because what they've done is they've made it okay. And, you know, almost even cool in a way, like I don't know if cool is the right way, but they've made it okay is the, is the right way of saying it. So like, Hey, um, I want to talk. I, it's okay to talk about this. It's okay to feel this way. So anyway, it's on our way. Uh, if you go to triple a D maybe F for foundation.org, but if they Google China McCarney, and triple A D, they'll, they'll find it. But again, the resources are free. I'm sorry, the the all the all the money collected goes back out to charity. And China, you know, like we talked about earlier, living it, you know, he's lived this, he's written from experience. There's free resources, by the way, on the website, even for like counseling. Yeah. Wow. It's it's really, you know, he's devoted his life, you know, besides, I mean. He's, he's really devoted his life to us too, but now he's really devoted his life to this cause and it's very meaningful to him. He still deals with this. So we talked about someone that's talking from experience. Um, so, and, and then the youth, I would say, yes, on YouTube, uh, it's eight years old now, but I really love this talk um, mainly because there is a guided meditation in yeah. there. And that's, and if you, they just Google Jager mental talk, uh, but as you said, there's you got so many free resources on our website as yeah. well. Make and sure another you guys go out. Yeah, it's Jager J A E G E R Sports dot com. Yep. And um exactly. and check it out. And you can find the Jager bands there as well. You Absolutely. Know, J- Alan founded Jager Sports uh, that principle of athletes need to develop both their physical and mental skills in order to be successful. And I mean, you, I, I challenge you to watch any professional sports nowadays and not see Jager bands. I mean, it's all over the place. Talk about (laughs) something that just absolutely uh, blew up. But speaking of guided meditations, another guided meditation that you did was on uh, speaking of Jeremy Sheetinger earlier on dugout chatter, the podcast that he does. I know that you actually went through one of those because I listened to that. And I've actually used that with some teams that I worked with not too long ago, the guided meditation you did on that again, just really focused on the breath and kind of getting into some of those things. So guys, all of these things are great resources and you're fortunate to have somebody who has all this wealth of knowledge and experience that's put out so much great free content that's out there available for you. And it just, you know, to the point we made earlier, it just takes picking up, getting on the computer, the internet, and you can pretty much find anything you want um, as far as that goes. But man, we can't thank you enough. I mean, it's been the hour flew by. I oh, yeah. I, I knew it probably would. Um, and you're definitely one of those people that, you know, on down the line, don't be surprised if you get another text message from me <laughs> saying, Hey, hey man, <laughs> what are you what doing? You do? Yeah. What you doing on Thursday? <laughs> well, just so you guys know, I mean this sincerely. I, I just, I feel like we've been in our own little bubble. I, I, I think your input, your questions really were so on point and you know, just sort of consistent with these ideas. And I love the fact that we got into some really deep stuff. And I, I think I'll just end on one point because you brought up sheets in that podcast. And I'm 
a little embarrassed I didn't bring it up before. I'm in trouble with Jeremy now. But um, the reason I love that Stick and Bob podcast we did, which is two hours and 47 minutes for the record. But, you know, if you want to do a deep dive, you, you've been forewarned. <laughs> it's funny, right? We can, we can go to a school for six hours for classroom, right? We can watch a, a, a longer movie for two hours and 45 minutes. I think of these, um, what do they call the um, after education courses that people, whether you're a, a CPA. Yeah, like or the a, post-grad stuff. Yeah. And I think about like how many hours you have to do of that. And yes, for a podcast, two hours and 47 minutes is a lot. But we really go through the one thing that I was so passionate about covering. And Sheets is such a stud, man, just the, the way this thing all rolled out. Um, we talk about how to implement this into your practice every day. Like, what does that look like to take your kids through a 10 or 15 minute guided meditation? Because for a lot of people, it's brand new, mm-hmm. it can be intimidating. If nothing else, it's just more of the unknown. And what we wanted to do is make it super user friendly. And, um, and so I love the fact that it's not only do I take them through guided meditation on the podcast, but we break down like this is sort of how the beginning looks, this is sort of how the middle looks, this is sort of how you bring them out. Because we want coaches to feel empowered, like, hey, I can do that. I can, even if I'm not great at it, I can sort of do that, sort of do that, sort of do that, and start the process and trust that I'm going to get better at it. Um, as I talked to these coaches earlier today in this meeting, it, the most important thing is the doing. Yeah. Even if it's not perfect, just the fact that you're stopping the kids every day and sitting them down or laying them down and tuning them into breathing, teaching them what it means to be neutral to thoughts that are coming in and out of their minds or emotions that may come up. What does it mean to stop? Here's a word I love that we talked about earlier today, permission. When's the last time you think some of these kids that are 16 or 21 or 14, someone gave them permission to stop or the guidance to stop? And said, hey, you have permission now to do nothing. To yeah. just settle. Yeah. It's well, uh, I, can, I can tell you there's a there's a group of 14 year olds that yeah. don't even know what's getting ready to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. love it. Show up to coming George's hey, next uh, baseball you, you, practice. The next time the next time my team gets together for real, we I've 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 started to take notes about how this season is going to be a little different on, on the things that we implement and, and what you and sheets went through and talked about is absolutely something that will be implemented at every single practice. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's uh, Brian Kane, you know, uh, saying is the start that stops most people is it's just getting started. Like you said, Alan, you know, it's, it's, it's going starting the first time. And I want to challenge the parents that are listening because we talk about this all the time. And Alan, we always, Brandon and I talk a lot about how parents are some of the first mental coaches that any of these uh, players will have because they have such an important role when they're young and they can start talking about self-awareness. They can start debriefing the day. They can start providing those feedback uh, forms, you know, to them. But one of the things that I would highly, highly encourage you all to do, you parents, is listen to that stick and ball podcast and Alan walks through that, or if you want to Google it on YouTube where he's walking through the same guided meditation. But get your kids working on this, sons, daughters, whatever the case may be. Get them doing this now. Spend some time, you know, make it part of your morning routine. Get them up a little bit earlier before school. And even if it's just five or 10 minutes that you just get them really starting their day, getting present, being in that state where they can just really focus on their breathing. And I I guarantee you, you will see a difference in, in the way that that child performs just throughout the course of the day. And for life. And also, I'm going to steal Brandon's word again, but I hope parents are curious um, because we all know that this generation is going through some challenges with COVID and other things and um, cell phones, you know, video games. There's a a lot of distractions out there. We know a lot of technology, obviously. Um, And I just hope, like, where do I start? I just hope that they're curious to say, hey, Let's go watch a video. Let's go watch a breathing exercise. Let's let me let me sit down with my my son or daughter and let me let me educate them a little bit on 
what is meditation about? What is relaxation about? What, why is it important to be in tune with your breathing or stop each day? And, and what does this have to do with life? Because I feel like if you, as you said, if you can get to the kids at a younger age and this is more normalized, um, you, the earlier you get these kids into this stuff, that's why I feel like at some point it's going to be taught in elementary school because the sooner you can start to get this integrated into our, our muscle memory, into our being, the better. So I, I, I second what you're saying, John, and I just hope, I just hope parents are curious and I hope the kid, and I hope for the kids that are listening, like be curious, like what, yeah, what can I do for my own mental health? Because it's free, by the way, that's the other thing. Everything we're talking about today is free. And by the way, Brandon, because I've said this every single time to every coach that I've ever talked to about implementing a practice, the one thing that you will not believe until you do it, the buy-in is going to be way bigger than you believe, okay. or you may think. One, two, you're going to have so many kids coming up to you after a couple of days of doing this saying thank you. Because the effect I feel at this stage of where things are at in life is visceral. Even a one 10-minute session. A lot of these kids can have a visceral effect of like so, of touching something. Wow, I've never been that relaxed, or I haven't been, I haven't stopped like that in a month, or right. I haven't felt re- being relaxed like that in two years. And they're intuitively going to feel and see what's happening. And so just know that this is coming. Okay. And I'm not one of those like salesy like you know here it comes, <laughs> but based on experience at least. Um, you're going to have a lot of kids and a lot of parents are going to send you emails or texts and say, thank you, because any sort of continuity, sort of consistent, you know, application of this, I'm telling you the upside, you cannot even measure it. And that's one of the, it will be one of the greatest, if not the greatest payoffs of a coach in your life is when you do this and you see the feedback for them is, is really impacting their lives. So I look forward to your feedback and I'm not saying, John, you're not doing that with your kids, but I'm just saying like the fact that you're getting your team going. So if you ask sheets or anybody that's done this consistently, it's like falling in love, man. It's, it's a very deep connection and it's, and it's, it's feeling this transformation, if you will, of all these healthy properties coming out. I mean, look, if we all just walked around today with a little bit less stress or a little bit less clutter. Right. Just a little bit. Now I'm talking about a lot. Happening. Yeah. But, so anyway, um, but thank you guys. Uh, uh, times a million, if that's even possible, because uh, this platform, this outlet, what you guys are doing, honestly, um, is all contributing to this transformation that the earth is going through right now for the better. And so I, I appreciate you doing it. And I really appreciate you having me on. Man, it's our pleasure. Thanks, Thank Alan. You. Have a great night. Thanks, you two. We'll be in touch. All right, buddy. See you. See you. Want to provide feedback or stay up to date with the show? Visit our Instagram page at Mental Advantage Podcast, or you can send us an email at podcast at mentaladvantage.net. To have John Cullen work with you or your team, please write to him at john.cullen at mentaladvantage.net. Thanks for listening to today's episode.